All right, so in this video, I will talk about nested repetition structures because sort of like what we had with the selection structures last week, um, we can actually nest our repetition structures, put repetition structures inside of repetition structures, uh, which leads to some interesting results sometimes. So let's take a look. And we are covering A5.5 in this uh, video. All right, so we can think about a clock. We have actually a sort of pseudocode representation of a clock where the second hand of an old fashioned analog clock is going to make a complete circle around the clock. And for every complete circle the second hand makes, the minute hand moves one position clockwise. You know, 60 seconds is a minute. Uh, we have every single second we're moving the second hand one position clockwise and then as soon as we've hit our 60th second you know seconds equals 60 which is greater than 59 we stop increasing the seconds we stop we stop uh worrying about the seconds and then we move the minute hand one position clockwise. And then we go back and we uh, go to the next minute. So the minute went from zero to one and then the seconds is reinitialized to zero. So the second hand is back facing up to the top and then it goes uh, one, two, three, four, five, moving, 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 moving for every single one of these until it hits 60. It stops moving once seconds is at 60 because there's only 60 seconds in a minute. It's supposed to go to second zero of the next minute. So we will make that happen. And then the minute hand moves one position clockwise again. So now it's at minute two and so on and so forth. For every single minute, we move the seconds hand 60 times from zero to 59. And all of that is a prerequisite for the minute hand to be moved. So once the second hand goes from 0 to 1 and then 1 to 2 and et cetera, et cetera, all the way from 50 to 59, when it tries to go from 59 to 60, that's when we know it's time for another movement of the minute hand. So that's sort of what I'm trying to get at. For every minute, the second hand moves 60 times. For every iteration of the minute loop, we have 60 iterations of the second loop. And in total, there are 3,600 iterations of the second hand. When you take a look at all 60 iterations of the second hand uh, times every uh, one of the 60 iterations of the minute hand. So then 3,600 seconds in an hour. That's the idea that we're working with with our nested loops is this idea of this entire loop on the inside, the inner loop running in its entirety before the outer loop can even finish its iteration. So as you might expect, a nested repetition structure is a repetition structure contained in another repetition structure. During each iteration of the outer loop, the inner loop runs fully and completely every single iteration of the inner loop completes before the iteration of the outer loop can actually finish. So I have an example of nested for loops right here, just some quick pseudocode. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm starting int count at zero. I'm starting some unrelated counter to be zero. Not the counters associated with the for loops. Those are just there to make the for loop happen. What I'm doing is I'm counting how many times the inner loop actually runs, how many iterations there are. Now, every time we run the for, the inner for loop, there are five iterations where we increase in count by one. Every time, you know, and, and this happens for every iteration of the outer for loop, which iterates in total three times. And then we display the results at the end. So the question is what value is displayed in label result.txt when I 
um, when I give it the value of int count. How many times have we increased int count by one? That's the num that would be equal to the number of times that we've actually seen an iteration happen on the inner loop, right? So how many iterations of the inner loop has it been? Well, the inner loop in total is going to run n times m times, where m is the number of times the inner loop runs, and n is the number of times the outer loop runs. And you can actually see that right here, how I'm using n and m for the outer and inner loop, respectively. So int count, we can expect to be the number of times int n gets increased times the number of times int m gets increased, right? That's at least what I'm claiming right here, which would imply that int count would run 15 times. So, I mean, we can sort of think about that in our heads really quick. For the first iteration of int n, when n equals one, m is going to first be one, then two, then three, then four, then five. So this inner loop is running five times, which means that int count gets one added to it five times. So at the end of all five iterations of int m, int count will equal five. And then we finish the first iteration for int n, and then n goes to two. We uh, add one five more times to int count, which means int count is 10, and then n goes to three. We add uh, one five more times to int count, so int count becomes 15. Uh, n goes to four, it's kicked out of the outer loop, and we display it. So we're displaying 15, which is equal to three times five. All right, so I've whipped up a quick pseudocode example right here that is going to generate a whole bunch of ordered pairs. Uh, you might remember this from some of your algebra classes where you have an ordered pair where, you know, it gives an x, y point on a plane or something like that. So one, two is uh, one to the right on the x-axis and two up on the y-axis, right? Um, that's what I'm generating right here. What I'm doing is I'm generating all of the ordered pairs possible where the x value is going to be all of the odd numbers between one and six, and the y value is going to be all of the odd numbers between one and 10. So the possible x values are one, three, and five, and the possible y values are one, three, five, seven, and nine. Um, so that's what this is doing right here. All, all of the um, x values here, when I'm saying, uh, X, int x is going to be from 1 to 6 in increments of 2. I'm, it starts at 1 and it's going to increment by 2, so it's only going to be odd values, similar with what I'm doing with int y right here. Now, notice how I've nested this, right? Um, you know, I start out with an empty string, uh, string pairs, which lists all of my uh, pairs. And then inside of, you know, I, I get the first x value in the first iteration of the outside loop. So x, int x is going to start out as one. And then the inside loop is going to have all of the y values that are going to match with this x value. So I'm going to get all of the possible ordered pairs where int x is one. So that will give me, what I'm trying to get from this inner loop is one, 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 three, one, five, one, seven, and one, nine. Now, the way I'm going to do this is for each x, y combination, I'm going to append to the end of string pairs, whatever is there, right now it's empty, I'm going to append to the end a left parenthesis, and then the x value converted to a string, and then I put a comma and a space so it looks nice, and then the y value converted to a string, and then a closing right parenthesis, but then I put a space after that as well because I'm expecting more ordered pairs after this. And then I'll do this for each value of y. So first we'll append the ordered pair one, one, and then it'll be uh, one, three. So parenthesis, uh, the string containing one, comma, space, the string containing three, parenthesis space. 
and then 1 5 gets concatenated to the end, and then 1 7, and then 1 9. And then y becomes 11, and 11 is greater than 10, so we kick ourselves out of the inner loop. And you'll see right here that I append a new line to the end, which means that after I um, have finished all of the ordered pairs where the x value is 1, it's like I'm pressing enter. And then we go to the end here, we come back up and x goes from 1 to 3. 3 is less than 6, so we do all that again. Now we're appending 3, 1, 3, 3, 3, 5, 3, 7, 3, 9. The uh, inner loop ends, we append a new line, and then we um, go back up to the top, and so on and so forth. And this is the result. This is what string pairs is going to hold. All of these ordered pairs where the x and y values are separated by a comma and a space, and all of the ordered pairs themselves are separated by a space. And then at the very end, once I've done all of the values of y, once I've finished the inner loop, I um, stick a new line at the end and it comes down to the next line. It's a new line. And then I, you know, then go and start the next iteration of the outer loop. So now x is 3. And then I look at all of the possible ordered pairs starting with 3. And then we reach the end of the inner loop. We go to the next line. We hit a new line. To the next iteration of x. So now x is 5. Uh, and we get uh, all of the possible ones where x is 5. And then, you know, we hit a new line because there's a new line at the end of this row as well. So the end of the string is a new line character. That's why I have this quotation mark at the very bottom right here rather than at the end of the 5, 9 is because at the end of every single iteration of the outer loop, we put a new line there. So that's important to keep in mind if you do something like this with your nested loops. Now there's one last thing that I want to talk about, which is regarding nested for loops. Um, now I'm still going to look at the pseudocode right here, but notice that int y, you know, let's say we're declaring int y inside of our for loop, as well as int x inside of the outer loop, because we don't actually have the declaration statements above like we do with our string pairs. So we're declaring int y in the for loop and we're declaring int x in the for loop. Now we talked about how variables declared in for loops like this, when our counter de variables are declared in for loops, they have block scope. So you can't use them outside of the for loops, which means in this case, int y can only be used inside of the inner loop. Once we hit end repeat for int y and then continue on afterwards, we can't use int y anymore. We can only use int y inside of the inner loop. And we certainly cannot use int y outside of the outer loop. I mean, we can't use it outside of the inner loop, so we certainly can't use it outside of the outer loop. Same with int x, we can't use that outside of the uh, outer loop. However, we can use int x inside of the inner loop, as I've demonstrated right here, by using int x dot string in the creation of the ordered pair. So that's really important to keep in mind. All right, well, that's nested repetition structures. Um, you know, there's no difference in syntax for nested loops or anything like that. You really don't need to worry about that so much. Uh, it's just like using a regular loop, except for the fact that it's inside of another loop. So I wanted to focus more on the consequences of putting a loop inside of another loop. You know, how many times you run the inner loop before, yeah, like it, it, in total for, based on how many times the outer loop runs, right? So that kind of stuff gave you that example with the ordered pairs. But if you feel comfortable with the do loop and the for next syntax, then nested repetition structures should not be too hard for you to, to implement at all. So yeah, I, I hope this information helps you as you navigate working with that.